it's coming and that's mandatory recurring financial and non-financial sustainability reporting for companies around the world and it's imminent. This will be all new territory for most corporate C-suites and boards and on the front line for this task will be the company's reporting officers. Many are not prepared. They don't know how to compile the reports and what information should be included. The ESG exchange has got deep global expertise on both the process and the content. The state of the art how-to guide for sustainability reporting has been built by our global network of leading sustainability standard setters and regulators. We assist corporate leaders in the field of sustainability across diverse professions, industry sectors and geographies globally. The ESG Exchange's collaborative approach is working hand in hand with company officials facilitating their sustainability reporting. It makes it straightforward, it makes it less burdensome, it reduces the time needed to complete the process too. The ESG Exchange's unique five-module playbook provides clear and concise how-tos on a whole range of subjects including data and technology, operational processes, business analytics, auditable report production and repeatability and refinement. It removes the guesswork. Subscribers to ESG Exchange's implementation and training program have secure portal access to multimedia learning content and our discussion forums are available to all subscribers as are demand-driven support resources. Subscribers capitalize on our extensive global practitioner experience to demystify financial and non-financial sustainability reporting. The ESG Exchange is an initiative of the Good Governance Academy and its patron is none other than Professor Mervyn Kim. Hello everybody and welcome to this very special event, the ESG Exchange Information Event. It's sponsored by the JSE, by the Johannesburg Stock Exchange Limited. And uh, my name is Bruce Whitfield and it's my great privilege to be uh, the chief cook and bottle washer of this event, the chair, the CEO, the um, convener. There we go. That's I knew I'd get there eventually. Um, thank you for sharing where you're all coming from. Um, John Daniels is there. Thank you, John. Jack's brother, John. Uh, I saw Althea Whitfield, uh, not related, so there's no nepotism here. Hello, Althea. Distant cousin, I'm sure. Uh, we have delegates. Well, I've seen Baba in uh, Sydney, I think it is, uh, back with us again. Nice to see you. Uh, and we've got guests from absolutely everywhere in the world this uh, this afternoon in South Africa, middle of the night in New Zealand, and also hopefully to Australia and to the JSE today. Um, uh, Joanne Henstock, we're hoping that Joanne Henstock will join us. Uh, it is the middle of the night in Australia. Um, so we'll hope to, to see Joanne's uh, today, but we do have international board advisor Peter Crow, um, who is with us and there's Peter with his degree certificates behind him. Um, he is um, just south of Auckland in New Zealand um, and he was uh, approaching midnight his time and he's got to fly get a flight early in the morning so we'll make sure that we finish on time for him and then Shamila Subramani also from the JSE um, she is in and out of meetings with uh, Leila Faree the chief executive of the JSE this afternoon so I'll be shouting at Leila quietly to release Shamila to into our care um, so that she can make a contribution as chief sustainability officer of the JSE today as well. Um, thank you for sharing your locations in the chat if I can ask you to reserve the Q&A function uh, for the serious questions that you want to ask chat amongst yourselves by all means uh, but if you can comment on us keep it clean keep it tidy keep it nice please in the chat function uh, but if you've got questions to ask um, of Carolyn uh, Chalmers this afternoon and of Peter Crow uh, please put it into the Q&A function and I will make sure that before three o'clock this afternoon we facilitate those questions for you and if we don't get to all of the questions Carolyn is very good about following up after you. <laughs> Well, Carolyn Chalmers, who is CEO of ESG Exchange, you've got 15 minutes um, to talk to us about the importance of sustainability, which when its original genesis, it struck me that sustainability reporting was the public relations bit at the end of the financial statements. The annual report would come, um, there would be the staid pictures of executives at the front, and then all the warm and glossy trees and bunnies and things at the back of the annual reports. And that would be the sustainability stuff that nobody ever went to because 
Yes, it was glossy, but it was never the photography like Vogue or anything else to make worth looking at. But that's changed, thank goodness. Um, the next 15 minutes are yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And I see Joanne has joined us. Hello, Hello Joanne. Joanne. I haven't introduced you already, <laughs> but there you are. Welcome. Nice to have you. Excellent. We're, we're at full strength almost. Off you go, Carolyn. Excellent. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen um, to take us through... Uh, really what we're talking about today in uh, the capabilities needed, as you say, to do those sustainability reports. They were at the end of the of the reports, but in fact, what's happening um, in the world generally and internationally is that those sustainability reports are actually becoming the primary information that needs to be presented. So it's not so much as we think about the bunny hugging and, and the trees, et cetera, um, but really we're also looking at the stability of the organization beyond just financial stability. So looking at uh, stability of the organization over, over time. So if I can just introduce the uh, competencies that we're going to be talking about today, I'm, I'm going to refer back to the ESG exchanges playbook um, as the five competencies that, that we have identified, but maybe in today's conversation, there are some more competencies. I'm going to use the website just to show everybody um, that this information is available on the website. And I'm going to scroll through in terms of the solution itself is this interactive knowledge exchange, the how-to playbook, um, the uh, uh, learning process, and also the uh, embedded international certification and benchmarking. In terms of the, the how-to playbook itself, uh, we, we identify, and I'm, this is a bit small, I've been trying to make it a little bigger, but essentially we are implementing the ability for organizations to do sustainability reporting as is needed in, in the world today and in going, going forward. And there we are implementing a management system in the organization over five modules. And that management system needs to be supported with the right um, activities in the organization. So the capabilities such as data and technology, but also with people who actually know what they're doing. Um, so we're calling those the competencies. And that's really what we're talking about today. And we've identified five roles in an organization that really need to focus on these competencies. So if I'm just going to go down to these five roles in the people side of things. And those roles is, um, yes, it's the financial people, and those are generally the people that we look at for our uh, corporate reporting. Also the assurance, that the risk and the compliance people associated with those reports. But if the board doesn't know um, what is coming down the line with this mandatory reporting, and it doesn't have the right terminology and language, um, we have a problem. Um, and I'm sure Peter today will talk about, Peter Crow will talk about the, the board competencies we need in this new world. Then, of course, the executives need to understand so that they can uh, manage the organization. We need the operations side, which I'm going to talk to in from the IT and technology, business transformation, um, procurement, et cetera. Um, and then the stakeholder relations side of things, so investor relations and the traditional CSI, corporate social investment, which I think those are more of the kind of the softer issues. And then Joanne will talk to us about the changing finance and assurance uh, competencies. But just to mention the five personas that would we feel would really need to, to have different competencies perhaps in addressing, or maybe or maybe not in addressing uh, sustainability reporting. So going into the, the process itself and the five modules as I spoke about, so we it's an implementation program. It's not a not a, a learning or an education program over these five modules. And because it's an implementation program, this is not a, a, a quick fix. Um, we're looking at three years to complete all five modules. And when we speak to the organizations such as Unilever and ABN AMRO and those big guys that have done it for many years, they're saying five years is optimal, seven years, you've got a good product, but three years, you're being highly ambitious. So when uh, organizations hear about three years and they think, oh, that's, that's far too long, just think that the organizations that have experienced it are spending a, a lot, have spent a lot longer in getting there. So this is the first pass. Um, we talk about the, so in the traditional people process technology, or we're calling them proficiencies, We've got these 
five corporate personas, but also looking at the five organizational competencies that go with that. And we talk about things like language and terminology, um, maybe the ability to do significant business transitions and transformations, actually thinking from a perspective of resilience and resiliency. And perhaps we haven't been so good with the risk side of things, certainly in financial services, there's been a large push from a risk perspective, but many organizations don't really, you know, haven't really instilled risk throughout the organization. And I'm looking at the smaller organizations here. And then of course, bringing in the new terminology around integrated thinking, what does that mean? Um, looking at assurance uh, around your internal controls. And there again, we've got risk embedded and then performance over the longer term. So actually looking at um, how do we cater for the pressures of shareholders and for the listed organizations, uh, such as those on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, driving for financial returns. Um, and we've got sustainability drivers that are looking for the longer term. So how do we weigh up those aspects? So just to dive down into these competencies, we have put them together, these capabilities and competencies in a, what we're calling an ESG value stack. And that's really together the capabilities or the activities, as well as the, the thinking and thought processes behind it, your skills and competencies, together creates value for the organization. And that's why we're calling this the value stack. And there's a little bit of information on the website. Of course, um, a lot more information is uh, available in the playbook and in the modules. And that is currently in, um, is being distributed through the Johannesburg Stock Exchange's Training Academy. So I thought just a whistle stop around um, the program and where we think the competency should lie. But I'd really am looking forward to hearing from the team, Bruce, in, and the panel in terms of actually how does that seem and how does that sense uh, resonate with the people who are dealing with this on a, on a daily basis. Thank you. And I took a lot less than 15 minutes, I think. You did, Carolyn. You were very self-disciplined. Congratulations. Um, Bila, let's start with you. Let's get a, a little perspective from you, if we can, sort of free time from you to give us a, a perspective on sustainability reporting from just south of Auckland. With volume, with audio preferably, um, you know, unmuted would be nice. There we go. Um, he wants to test our lip reading skills. Have you ever tried to lip read a kiwi? That's impossible. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, so, so sustainability as an idea is far from new. It's, uh, it's something that's been around for a long time. Um, most of us remember uh, our, our fathers and our mothers, those of us with rural environments, how if you do certain things on the land, uh, that, that you'd look after your animals and you could come back and have new animals and, and new crops next year and you could keep going over, over time. And the Aborigines in Australia with their, with their fire programs to uh, spark off the seeds so they, that they could grow new, new plants in years, years to come. Uh, all of this idea is, is really the genesis of what now has become sustainability. So the goal is to ensure that we've got an organisation that's going to endure over time, over the decades, uh, and this is important. So that's, that's not new. What is new is that we're starting to take it more seriously. So from the board's perspective, we've come through CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. We've got this new fad word called ESG, Environment Social Governance. Uh, but there's there's a piece missing on that one, which is which is the economic, and that's and that's why uh, the ESG exchange uh, becomes so important to us because it reintroduces that third capital that's so important. So for many of us, uh, people, planet, profit, we understand that. That's those are the big pieces. Uh, that are necessary in our, in our commercial uh, engagement and across in society. And they map quite nicely uh, in, in terms of um, the social, the environmental and the, and the economic drivers. So sustainability from a boardroom is to be sitting there and taking a much more holistic view. 
uh, and understanding what is the big picture? What are the types of decisions we might need to consider today strategically so that this business continues to operate well tomorrow, next week, next year, next decade? And not only does it continue to operate well, but we do the right thing by our customers. We do the right thing by our suppliers. So the competencies that we need uh, within our boardroom are probably no different than what we've needed for many decades. What we do need, though, is a wake-up call for our directors to take this seriously. And that, and that is a change. Uh, directors are a little bit intimidated by this stuff at the moment. And they're intimidated because, quite frankly, they're being asked to do their job. And that's no bad thing. So let me just um, leave it with those very high-level opening statements uh, that somebody else might want to uh, uh, jump from, or I might come back to them a little later, depending on the conversation with uh, participants. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Um, Joanne, uh, you are the, the, the mistress of deception. It is the middle of the night where you are, yet the moon <laughs> is either incredibly, incredibly bright in Australia or, or you're using a background. But uh, Joanne Headstock is in Australia um, and Joanne is one of our uh, participants today. Um, she has provided ESG services worldwide. And thank you for joining us in the middle of the night from Australia. Um, your perspective, please. And uh, we'll make sure that everybody is out by three o'clock. And I see that Shamila has joined us as well, um, which is nice to see you there, Shamila. Um, and uh, I've already, by the way, WhatsApped your boss and said you're going to be late for your meeting. Um, so you can stay with us still to meet. Um, <clears throat> Joanne, your perspective, please. <laughs> Hello, Bruce. Um, thanks for the introduction. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Peter. Hi, Shamila. It's so nice to be on this panel with you. Um, it's a great discussion and a very good topic about these competencies. Um, as we work with corporates um, on their sustainability reporting, and as Peter rightly said, this has suddenly become something, um, uh, you know, with very different emphasis. Before, it used to be something that happened in the background, and now suddenly it's actually mainstreaming in a very fast and incredibly challenging way for many corporates. So the competencies that I think are probably the first competencies that need to be given attention to are those that enable a corporate reporter or a business to decide what the material impacts and dependencies are on the business. So fortunately in South Africa, we've had some introduction to this through the um, widespread use of the integrated reporting framework that the JSC also um, backed from the very beginning. And that, that um, initial introduction to a multi capitals approach has helped many of our South African reporters get ahead in this space. But globally, reporters and finance teams are, are struggling with the idea of how you apply a wider concept of materiality. You know, you'll have heard in the context of the ISB standards how they're talking about double materiality and dynamic materiality. And um, these, these, you know, multiple materialities are being drawn together. But um, reporters um, and finance teams really struggle with how they actually pin down what's material. Um, we automatically, through our training and education, default to the Chicago School of Business economic model and uh, where financial capital is emphasized um, and the enterprise value model that SB is promoting. So uh, that's the easy part in a way. Um, but the more challenging part is to decide if you look across the other capitals, which often um, inherently um, encapsulate the idea of externalities, how you uh, decide among those, among those many other capitals, um, what is material and what is not. And I think that's an incredibly important competency and we need um, to think deeply about what frameworks we use to help us discern what is material, what, you know, what is material for your, um, your wider stakeholders and your investors and shareholders to tell them about your business so that as Peter said, it will be sustainable into the future. Um, and so in my mind, that is what reporters are struggling with. Um, you know, never mind the data and the quality of the data. It's deciding <clears throat> what are you actually looking to tell your reporters about what's important to your business in terms of impacts and dependencies. And often because we're relatively new at this, we've had so many decades to get used to financial capital and materiality in that context. Because it's so new, you know, the, the result is often quite imperfect. And um, so it, it requires a, a very sort of um, honest reporter to say, well, I'm going to, you know, um, uh, really drill down on this as opposed to just take a superficial approach. Um, so that's a big thing. And then I think when we look at the, the assurance teams, risk compliance and audit, 
um, they're kind of your second line of defense type activities. So the first order issue is to make sure that once you know what material it is, and that's a big win already when you get to that point, uh, once you're at that point is what data will help you to tell or to, you know, to disclose these material um, information and the material impacts and dependencies to the people that deserve to know your users, providers of capital, providers of human, you know, human capital and all the rest. And so um, what data you then collect to show those impacts and dependencies and their impacts on the organization is a second order issue. Um, that also requires a fair amount of craft, craftsmanship. Um, and specifically, once you decide what data it is, you have to make sure that the data that you then deliver and compile into reporting is fit for purpose, is reliable, relevant, complete, accurate, valid, and all the rest. And that itself requires a further overlay of discipline and effort and integrity. Um, and the assurance functions are there to make sure that the management team are kept honest in that regard. Um, so you might say, by the time you get to the assurance team, you're quite far down the track in terms of challenges the challenges are primarily on the, the managers um, of the business and the finance team to say, what are we going to report in the first place? Secondly, how do we make sure that it's fit for purpose? Thirdly, um, who's going to check and keep us honest? You know, so that's kind of the sequence of events. I'll maybe stop there. Wonderful. I, I love the, the, the focus and the importance of integrity in this process, because without integrity, the rest of it is completely worthless. Um, thank you very much, Joanne, in Australia. Um, Shamil Abraham in Johannesburg, um, good to have you with us today as well, the Head of Sustainability at the JSE. As one of the many regulators in the world, you, in the regulatory framework in South Africa, you must be looking forward to a global standard, if that's possible, from a sustainability point of view. Hi, Bruce. Hi to everybody. Um, and Joanne, thanks for joining us at the darkest, deepest hours in Australia. Um, so, Bruce, you know, I think that the context here is beyond <clears throat> the regulatory. So whilst standardization certainly helps from a regulatory perspective, um, I think the considerations that we need to have are really about what is it that we're trying to drive and change when we're considering sustainability as a whole. And in that context, it's about saying that we exist within a set of finite boundaries. There are social, social foundations that we need to maintain and our businesses need to operate within that context. And the matter of context, I think, is often what is missing. And so the why are we doing this is the question that we need to continually ask. And therefore, how does my business fit in and how does that happen? So regulation obviously has a big part to play. And in some instances, it might just well be that the stick is just going to be the only thing that's going to change behavior. And But then again, how should that be deployed? To what end are some of the questions that need to happen? So certainly standardization is welcomed. There's no doubt about that. And the IWSB's work in that regard, and thank you, uh, Carolyn, for posting in the chat about what that meant. Too many acronyms in this space. There's no doubt enough to drive anybody crazy. But the IWSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, is trying to aim for that universal baseline. Um, and they have made it very clear that they support the building's box approach in different jurisdictions. And that in itself, I think, uh, implicitly suggests that context matters a lot. And so the kind of elements that Joanne has already brought up talk to that directly. So how are you going about creating value? How are you drawing on these different capitals? The financial materiality perspective, one could argue, has already been embedded in much of what we do, right? And that's kind of the outside in. What is this going to cost me? Why does it matter? But the second perspective of the how do I exist Why and, and what my impact is outside is perhaps the one that is as important and is when we continue, when we consider this continuum, we go from a single materiality perspective or just a purely enterprise value financial perspective towards saying a double materiality actually has to consider what is it that I do and how does that impact on the world around me? And then with sustainability, the explicit consideration, obviously, of your environmental and social context is where that comes in. So, yes, yeah, so while that baseline standard, I think, is going to be welcome because at least it gets, hopefully, gets everybody onto the first step of the ladder, the second step of the ladder, we need to already be thinking beyond that. And why that needs to happen is because, is, is firstly, time bound. The, number of the, ch the challenges that we're talking about largely are things that are going to be going to see man the worst impacts of manifesting in the shorter term already. Some of those we've seen, climate change is often considered the poster child for sustainability, although we know that is certainly not the only issue in the broader spectrum of sustainability when we think about the E and the S. Um, and you can see that those things are going to manifest in that term. Now, the consequences of that 
are certainly going to be of, of impact to us and have a very much a material impact that we're going to like, we're likely to see. Climate change, for example, I guess is easier because the quantification um, is perhaps a lot more advanced than a number of the other areas. However, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be applying our mind to those. And that's where, from a regulation perspective, it perhaps becomes a little bit more tricky. And the need, again, for companies to start thinking beyond just that baseline approach and how does this matter financially right now is going to be even more important because that is going to talk to their long-term ability to survive and thrive in that context in which you operate that does have very finite boundaries. So, so Bruce, I'm hoping that helps set the context and interrelationship oh, between regulation as well as the need to actually think beyond that. Thank you, Shamila. Very valuable. Uh, all of you, thank you very much for kicking it off for us. Um, to the rest of you, 223 of you who have joined us today from all over the world, and that's a great turnout. Thank you very much. But to make it really worthwhile for you, um, you need to do a little bit of work, I'm afraid, and that is to ask us questions that are pertinent to you. Um, keep it nice and tight. Please put them in the Q&A box. There's lots of wonderful communication and chat happening in the chat box, but questions, please, in the Q&A box, greatly appreciated. Carolyn, not everyone's going to have seen um, the article that you've just posted, and you are posting lots of very relevant links, and thank you for that. Um, not everyone's going to have the time to go back. So just summarize for me, please, the debate around this wish for a global standard. Um, you know, we've got a global standard in accounting, which I think half the world is still trying to figure out which way is up. Um, sustainability, because of all of the intangibles in it, is that much harder? Is it worth trying to get a global baseline from which to work and develop? Mm. Uh, it's a very good question, and uh, that article does go some of the way. Uh, it's an article, um, one of the authors is Bob Eccles. Um, uh, it goes some of the way in saying, look, it's fraught with, with problems and including political problems, um, different jurisdictions, nationalities, etc. So um, I've worked for many years in developing um, ISO standards, international standards, organization standards. Um, we recently published last year the uh, international standard. It's a guidance for the governance of organizations and people felt that we could never have an international standard for governance, for corporate governance, let alone the governance of any type and size of organization. Um, so we we can do it. It is possible. Um, it does mean that it does need a, um, a structured uh, manner, approach to bringing experts together. And it also does mean um, considering the lowest denominator. So it is aspirational in the ISO standard. On, on It's called ISO 37000 as a governance of organization guidelines. But what we've also done, and I think that's something that's been born out of South Africa, is taken a principled-based approach. And that, again, is, is Professor King's uh, drive, is instead of taking an absolute um, compliance base, this is what you must do and this is what you must not do, rather take a principled-based approach and say, this is what you should be doing. This is what good looks like. Um, and I think um, in looking at international standards at in this kind of sphere, that is more of, of a, an approach that would be get your globalization. It's probably a more, more successful approach. So what we can do is we can put together a, should we say, conceptual framework. And I know that in that report, there was a financial conceptual framework that didn't really work. <laughs> but if we think about a conceptual framework based on principles with some um, substance to it, some guidance in terms of what the practices should look like, um, I think on that basis, we can then look at national imperatives and build on top of it. So there is this concept of building blocks and these um Standard setters are talking about a building blocks approach that says, here's our global standard, but on top of that, add in your national imperative. So in South Africa being one of the largest emitter, uh, carbon emitters in Africa, the largest, I should say, um, you know, we obviously carbon is going to be one of our national imperatives, whereas our next door neighbor in Namibia is one of the largest carbon sinks in, uh, in Africa, well, in Southern Africa. So carbon is, shouldn't be on their priority list. There should be something else. So water for example, so being in a desert environment. So, so I think every national imperative needs to have a place and it needs to come through in the reporting. 
um, because of the sustainability of that organization in its context. But there is a possibility of getting a global norm that is a principle based. I think there is a, I've seen it work. Um, I, I'm hopeful. Um, I, but I know we've got a lot of um, politicking and um, politicking going past. And of course, you've got both extremes. You've got, you know, the, the fundamentalists um, and then you've got the, the non-believers. So, um, we're going to have extremes and we're just going to have to work between those extremes. There was a question um, in the Q&A about um, are private companies going to um, have to report on these um, standards? And, and I'd just like to mention um, along the lines of having a global um, you know, standard is that there is a growing global need um, and demand for sustainability or, or say long-term thinking and making sure that when you're investing, that you're investing, whether you're purchasing, whether you're employed, join an, an employment contract, it, you have got a longer term perspective there. It's not going to fold next month and it's certainly not going to impact your the society that you're living in. So what, what we're seeing is actually, it's not so much that this is going to be a um, compliance mandatory requirement, but it's a way of that life is moving. And certainly um, the capital providers, the cost of capital has to increase if you've got risk associated with sustainability, who's going to invest in something when it's not going to be around? So if, if you can't prove that you're going to be around through your reporting and data, your capital provider is going to have to put a risk premium to that to say, well, this is risky. So I'm going to weight it. Either I'm going to increase my interest rates or I'm certainly going to decrease my investment, but there's going to be some kind of a financial response to an inability to produce this information. So is it mandated? Um, might be, but certainly it's going to be expected as part of your financial or stability reporting. Got you. Nice Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, Peter, you put your hand up quite early into Carolyn's answer. You wanted to add? Uh, I, 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 react, uh, yeah, I, re I react with my hands, I'm sorry. And uh, it's. I think it's part of the way we do Zoom and we've all become familiar with over the last couple of three years. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the point that Carolyn made early on in her conversation is one that gives great comfort to company directors and boards. And that is this, this splitting out uh, between principles and practices. Uh, even the word governance in principle has been quite stable as a definition for, for you know, thousands of years. But the way that we practice governance, put those principles into practice necessarily uh, are, are going to be quite um, specific, even idiosyncratic, the way that the five of us as speakers on this panel, uh, we go about uh, running our boardrooms uh, will be will be quite quite different and necessarily so. So I think there's three layers that probably need to emerge. And the first is um, some sort of agreement on what those high level principles need to be. And, and, and uh, I, I would um, support Carolyn's um, comment that, um, yes, it's going to be turbulent getting there, uh, but if we, can, if we can work towards that over the next wee while, uh, then we've got half a chance. Uh, the next one down is, is more the national or regional level issues. Uh, which which uh, which can be tackled, uh, and then when we come into the individual organisations or, or within a sector, uh, then then that um, that degree of separation and that idiosyncratic where my company is different from your company starts to make sense. At that level, we need to let the companies do the right thing, because as soon as we start mandating at a company level, the natural human behaviour is to treat it like a rule. And we know what happens with rules. We work really, really hard to fit in, or we don't, right? Interestingly and curiously, the corporate governance codes around the world, not universally, but most of them, are pitched on the basis of doing a better job, but they drive compliance behavior, comply or explain, that's a compliance behavior. So the great challenge here for this whole body of work is how do we support boards in particular 
to maintain a performance focus and to work closely with their leadership teams uh, to do same. Because the minute we take a compliance focus, which is where governance has got to in many cases, um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end up going down rabbit holes. I'm sorry. Uh, I recall Russell Loebscher, who was the chief executive of the JSE 20 years ago, telling me a story of in the early days of the focus on corporate governance, he was aware of the chairman of a company who would move himself around the boardroom table to do governance tick box exercises. So he would raise a point and then move to another point at the table and almost respond to his own point. And minutes were taken and it was seen as being perfectly legitimate. You get that sort of balmy activity happening when you make rules. Um, and exactly right. So so here, here is a rule. This is one specific case and it happened on the 30th of June uh, in a boardroom here in New Zealand. So I was chairing the board. It's a privately held business. It's 150. It's a sizable farming horticulture business. Uh, and uh, we had the bank manager and bank executives in the room. We were signing off our annual budget. We were also signing off for the first time ever our sustainability policy, one page. Mm. Once we signed off on that, the bank took... I won't tell you the exact number, but between 10 and 20 basis points off our bank debt. So our cost, our cost of debt financing reduced by between 10 and 20 basis points because at a board level, we said healthy business, healthy environment, healthy people. And, and, and had some initiative and one page, right? Now, the job we have to do with our leadership team is ensure we put initiatives in place, which are quite detailed, to enact on that and provide accountability back to the bank to show that we've done what we said we would. We're really excited about that because we think we're going to make more money. But that's the point, isn't it? I mean, uh, Joanne, it, it's the incentive to be sustainable because there is a there is a financial reward for behaving ethically and, and, and sustainably. And it's once boards get their heads around that, that there is actually a bottom line benefit to this stuff, it actually becomes considerably easier to convince them to operate in a sustainable fashion. Mm. 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 Well, certainly uh, the companies and sectors that are most challenged by, you might say, negative stakeholder responses and engagement are often the ones that try hardest. Um, and so if we look at the track record of many um, JC listeds in the corporate sector, in the mining, you know, mining metal sector, we just see enormous efforts in that sector that you don't see in any other sector. And that's because they're already you know, walking through the fire in, in some sense on, on all these externalities and, and the risks that they represent, impacts and dependencies. So one only has to look in one, one's own backyard to see some you know, really fantastic examples of integration of sustainability information. Um, and, and then in sectors that are less challenged, you see less of an effort, isn't that ironic? Um, I do think though that one of the big challenges on these competencies is to make sure that they're integrated. You know, we see too many times that the, uh, the sustainability folks do the sustainability thing and never really integrate that into the finance sector, uh, the finance fu function um, uh, work processes. And I think that this is often needs to be led from the finance function side where you actually draw the sustainability data and disciplines into the finance function. Uh, that level of integration is something that is absolutely critical to make it work. And Carolyn, you're familiar with A4S um, based in London where they actually make a mission. It's a, it's a their, um, corporate mission to make sure that CFOs integrate sustainability into the finance function into the accounting and finance functions to make sure that they um, those disciplines sit together very closely as opposed to in separate houses in the organization, because then you get the disconnects happening quite quickly. Well, then it's integrated. And once it's integrated, you can't hide away from it anymore. Shamila, I know that you need to go. Um, so we, you spoke earlier about policing this idea of sustainability. Uh, and perhaps it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Perhaps it polices itself. Perhaps uh, it's the world of activists to do it. Perhaps if there is an incentive to operate in a more sustainable fashion, there's no policing required because actually the banks will police as to whether or not boards are sticking to the, the promises they've made. I'm just wondering whether or not we need to get our knickers in a twist over this. 
Yeah, Bruce, Bruce, good point. I think that we need to consider this as being almost like a combined governance ecosystem. And it's not just the traditional people that are called that governance that you think about, right? A regulator or a mandatory disclosure requirement or a standard, for example. But if we're looking at the fact that there's an increasing interest by society, because they're starting to see the impacts of many of these issues already coming to bear, and they're starting to feel those, and climate change is one of those, we see some tensions on social and inequality issues and the like, or already coming to have an impact. And then you're starting to also see, for example, activist shareholders who nobody's writing the script and saying, here's your regulation that you need to go now and you know work with to go to your board. They're kind of saying, well, actually, we understand this context of boundaries, we understand what's happening, we understand that you know we're having social foundations that are really crumbling, we have issues with the environment. And these are the things that matter to us because that affects our quality of life. And by the way, as businesses, you can't exist in a society that's failing, you know. And so what are you going to be doing about this? Please excuse me, Bruce, I have a horrible cold. And uh, also for some reason, my laptop has decided it doesn't, so I can't have, don't have the best uh, sound probably. Um, and so we need to consider that there's this combined governance ecosystem in a way. And, you know, so there are different stakeholders are going to put those pressures okay. on companies. Let, let, let's let you Sorry. go. I mean, so, you, you, you've lost. Um, in South Africa, one of the key... Yeah. Well, we're going to let you go. Unfortunately, your picture's disintegrating, your audio is disintegrating, um, and you do have a meeting to get to. So it was very well orchestrated. Well done. I don't know what plugin you put out, but you can share that information with us. We can all get out of meeting earlier in future. No, no. Bruce, can you hear me? Um, Camilla, thank can you, you very much. Uh, we're going to okay. we're going to release you and let you go. A uh, question from Kusi Kuma uh, saying quality is key reporting is important in SOE state owned enterprises or state owned companies. And again, this is a global issue uh, for economic activity in a country. Would it not be advantageous to have a principle based standard for public companies setting out the methods for identifying what needs to be reported, materiality, etc.? And this can be then narrowed down to private companies which exist in the same geographic area. I wonder if we need different principles for different entities depending on the ownership structures who wants to pick up on that uh Karen, you waved a hand that is, no, no, no. That, as pavlov's dog <laughs> I, 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 I i would actually like to hand it over to joanne okay joanne <laughs> Bruce, I think you answered the question already. Um, you know, we want principles uh, applying here to, you know, determine who does what. And there's absolutely no sense in um, overcomplicated, uh, over um, overcomplicating the application of the frameworks. I think once you have the universal principles down, which the frameworks are all intent on on doing, um, it's it's simply um, a matter of you know applying in in that. Uh, ownership context, ownership structure context. So I don't see the need for um, an extra framework or an extra layer to the framework. But um, clearly, you know, if you are in the public sector um, segment or sector, um, there are legal and regulatory peculiarities there that, you know, often um, make things complex. Um, those shouldn't stand in the way of the standard. It would, it, I think one's rather got to be intent on decomplexifying the way SOEs and public sector entities um, sort of uh, um, operate in a compliance environment. That's that's the real issue, not the reporting standards, I don't think. Um, and then somebody, uh, I think you have many South Africans, and this is not just a South African session today, but many South Africans say, well, state owned enterprises in South Africa can't even do financial statements. So it's a waste of time to expect them to apply the principles of sustainability. But we're talking about global standards here as well. And, you know, if one country, state owned enterprises can't get it right, well, that is then a jurisdictional issue. But Peter, one would hope that we can get a global standard that is applicable across whether it be the, the German Mittel standard, the family businesses in Germany, the state-owned mm -hmm. businesses in Germany, and publicly owned companies in Germany, or wherever that might be. And, and I think that's, that's absolutely correct. If we hold it at the level of principles, you know, what are we trying to achieve at a level of principle? And that's what jo that was the point that I think Joanne was making. She was she was distinguishing out those practices. And so the 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 operating purpose of a state-owned enterprise necessarily is going to be quite different from a, a stock exchange listed bank, um, from a mining entity, from from some um, high growth um, Silicon Valley or Boston uh, type operation. Uh, but they all need to demonstrate. 
uh, through the market forces and through adequate reporting uh, that they're fulfilling certain um, principles. You know, we, we, we have the social license to operate that some of us find um, that we've become kind of enamored with that term. It, it's really no different from that. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we have a problem though. Because as soon as somebody like Joanne or Peter or Carolyn or, or, or Prof King or somebody says principles, um, we get people saying, well, how do we implement them? And, and, and because we've got all of these people wanting, if you will, the detail. And of course, principles are not detail. Principles are big picture. And you've got to work out the detail yourself. So to your comment earlier, Bruce, we're asking these people who are going to utilise these principles to do some homework and to work out how they're going to apply them in practice. I remember 40 years ago when ISO, or 35 years ago when ISO 9000 was introduced as a quality standard. The first iteration was detail. The second and subsequent iterations were much more high touch uh, because we'd worked out what was needed. So we've got some turbulence to go through. Three years is about right, I think. It's aggressive, but it's about right, if we hold it at the level of principles. But we have to be aggressive. It's going to be the challenge. Uh, and, you know, I'm on record all around the world on this stuff, and I get my head chopped off uh, regularly um, because people want to go down to the detail. Detail can come later. Don't legislate detail. You'll just get fights. The only people that get rich are called lawyers. Uh, but, but, that, I, I told you I'd be provocative, Carolyn. Uh, but uh, this idea of being aggressive is absolutely pivotal, is it not? I mean, um, if, if you're going to sort of drag your heels around this as people who are leading the charge for sustainability reporting, Carolyn, you're wasting your time if you're not yeah. going to push, provoke, and promote as actively as possible. And, and, and we need to define the terms, you know, this ESG is a term, there's a massive um, debate going on around the world at the moment as to what ESG actually means. Is it a reporting mechanism? Or is it an ideology? And, and we're better off to put that to one side and say, look, it's irrelevant. What's relevant is the company for which I'm a customer, staff member, shareholder, uh, we want this company to be continue to operate in whatever the world looks like in 20 or 30 years' time. And we want it to be producing value. Mm. Um, let's not care what we call it. And we, and we want the world to look better than it does now, Carolyn, and that's the point. Yes. 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 So, I mean, it, uh, what I'm hearing, all of these terms and um, all of these, earlier on, we heard about double materiality and um, and then you, you also see these terms dynamic materiality and we hear about it. all, all of this um, sustainability reporting and these things are coming down the line. I'm just thinking from a, as a techie, as an IT person, um, I'm hearing this terminology going, okay, what does that mean for me? Uh, I, don't, I don't understand it. I'm sitting here... Um, you know, I'm in charge of a um, the, the technology for the organization. I know I'm hearing data. I'm hearing reporting. I'm hearing that this data needs to. Am I looking at a new financial type of system? So I think there's um, the organizations themselves. When when that information starts trickling down and and getting into the pool of people in the operational side of things, we have to be very careful that we don't get people um, making up their own stories as to what these things are. And they're actually, ex it's explained and described. And, you know, when you when you Google, and I just love Google um, and all of these um, search engines, but the trouble is that you don't know how to distinguish between something that's just marketing, something that's actually not, uh, not the right information anyway. So if I go and, and try and, as an IT professional, try and go, all right, sustainability, technology i'm going to get well all the different technology providers that are putting out their white papers and marketing information and i can't see the one from the other and that's when we had a whole industry around those organizations that develop independent views of different softwares um so i will run to my gartner equivalent or my forester to go and look well what software must i be looking at but we're starting from the wrong end then we're starting again from the practice as peter was saying because in fact, 
I need as an IT person to understand my competency is to understand, well, what is what is the principle? What are we trying to do here in the organization? Not what system can I implement to get the data in the right format? It goes to Walter Namasaki's question. And Walter says, what do you believe are the short-term and long-term effects on organizations for boards that refuse to implement? And I mean, just even the question is again sort of saying we I, I need some rules I need I need some guidelines I need something to do um, and uh, and it's such an interesting way of phrasing the question because I think this is what people are really struggling to get their heads around tell me what to do and then I can do it and we're saying to them well we're not going to tell you what to do no. we're just going to tell you no. to be better and, <laughs> and this freaks people out Joanne so, you know people want rules so they can either break them or stick to them um how do we help Walter get his his mindset altered in terms of what this idea of sustainability is all about well I think the way the market is going is that the you know the market will tell you by withholding access to capital or giving you access to capital or giving you better access to capital or you know more favorable terms on access to capital uh, those, those are the rules that will eventually rule game. Um, and I think uh, Peter gave us an example of how that worked in his uh, board situation earlier. But on a grand scale, that's exactly what the you know, European sustainable finance um, plan is all about. And all other uh, regulators that are you know, uh, pushing these things along through the mechanism of the market are on the right track. Um, uh, Shamila, I tried to release you earlier and I even told your boss that you were on your way. So I'm going to ask you to wrap up first this afternoon and then say, please excuse yourself and, or, and off you go to your other meeting. But just where do we go next in terms of our thinking? And the same question to everybody, um, our thinking around sustainability and its application um, mm-hmm. in, in our businesses across public, private sectors, private enterprise, listed companies. How yeah. do we do? Bruce, where to next should be where to anyway, which is first familiarize yourself with what these issues are. And so the existing governance context, I think, as we've already explored, has sufficient things in place that, you know, you have the mechanisms to bring them through. But it's the explicit consideration of those issues that we need to bring into our practice now and be able to say, what is an E issue? What is an S issue? How does this matter to my business? And also, how does my business impact on that? So some of the points that that I made earlier in that, and I think that that understanding of what these issues are is perhaps the biggest area that is lacking because once you do understand those the mechanisms to bring them into your business I think exist at least at a basic level across the board already but it's that explicit consideration the contextualization understanding the global issues narrowing those down to your operating boundaries for example and then saying how do I do that is is actually going to be critical from a more practical perspective if we are to solve for a lot of these challenges that we collectively face as society, then collaboration is going to be critically important as well. Um, So there's the mechanisms around collective governance and I was trying to get that earlier and I think that's when we broke up, is saying that there are stakeholders that are all involved in this process that need to hold us to account. So there's the education, certainly that is gonna be a constant need around the understanding of these issues. And what are we talking about when we talk about sustainability? How's that different to what we've done up to now? And so that understanding needs to happen then there's that understanding of what that means for businesses and, and who to know better than those businesses themselves. Those boards are occupied at being experts at their business, that management team that's occupying its daily mindset to understand that is the one best place to be able to understand how those issues impact its business, apply that thinking and then bring that through its governance frameworks and its practices, hopefully. So I think the way to next is going to be the education on those issues factoring that into governance and actually starting to increase its awareness. Am I gone again? No, oh, you're, you're gone. You're gone. You're gone. <laughs> you're trying so hard to leave. We get to let you go. Uh, thank you, Shamila, very much indeed. Uh, Peter, wrap up with you. Thanks, Shamila. Uh, with me. Um, yeah, I I want to go back uh, to an opening comment that I made, but embellish it very, very quickly. And the, the comment was essentially, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the sustainability thing has been around for a while. We're just, we, you know, we, we've got this propensity to, to pull out new names and put labels on things. But uh, if there's nothing new under the sun, I'd like to commend everybody on this call 
uh, to consider reading two books, neither of which uh, are on the bestsellers list for 2022. Uh, one is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, and the other one is called um, the, or the abbreviated name is The, the Wealth of Nations. Um, so Adam Smith, uh, the founder of and father of uh, modern economics, wrote these books. He's a Scotsman. He wrote them about 30 years apart in the 1700s, uh, talks about markets, talks about social engagement. I've been rereading them recently, and I've been um, recommending them to every board member who is serious about their fiduciary responsibility uh, to act in the best interests of others. It's amazing how Adam Smith remains relevant 350 years later. It's astonishing. Um, he doesn't they, know it, but he doesn't know it, but he's my hero. He care, actually. Um, you know, he, he, he's proof that if you're not sustainable. Anyway, uh, thank you, Peter. And, that was, that uh, was my comment. Thank you. Joanne. I think, um, you know, to the point of there being nothing new under the sun, I think that, um, you know, just watching the weather news, um, it, it tells us that there's a heck of a lot going on that's new under the sun. Um, you know, the, not not all pleasant stuff um, weather-wise, Peter. I don't, I mean this rather just with reference to weather events. Um, all of that is incredibly stressful, um, not only on companies and communities and countries, but um, on the natural ecosystems as well. And that is new under the sun. You know, we, we really are facing a, um, a cataclysmic um, cl climate and weather events. And, and that is certainly new and uh, requires rapid response. And I think um, it was Shamila earlier who was referring to ecosystem type coordination responses. And I think this is where Europe is, you know, already well down the track doing things the right way, you know, actually beating a drum um, reminding everyone continuously of a need to ramp up on an ecosystem level, all efforts. Um, you know, these efforts tend to go along fast and slow at the same time, um, and they need to be as coordinated as they can be. Um, and this is happening at policy level in, in Europe and the United Kingdom and in New Zealand as well. Uh, but the idea is to actually really move these um, efforts along in an ecosystem manner. If we don't, they will stumble and fall. And we'll be stuck with this, um, you know, the um, uh, the worst possible climate, you know, the physical uh, physical events that are going to accompany climate change. We're already seeing that. Uh, we're told that they will merely get worse. Um, and so, in that sense, the sustainability thing is not about the sustainability thing. It's about saving the planet. Um, there is no planet B, etc. Um, we've got many people telling us this all the time. Um, how much, you know, worse? How much? How much more wet bad weather do we want before we decide to turn the boat around? Mm. Thank you very much for that, Joanne. Carolyn, second last word to you, and then I'm going to play a quick dictionary game and let everybody get back to work. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I think, um, and I put it in the chat as well, it's really important that uh, we don't just all run to training uh, and we don't all just um, you know, go and tick the box. Because then training and building your skills is only part of part of the solution. Um, we actually have to do. So uh, Peter's right in terms of you have the competencies. You've been you should have been doing this all along. Um, we haven't. That's why we are where we are. So we have some competencies. We've got some new language we need to learn, but it's the application of that competency that's important today. And so if I can leave just the one message in today's webinar is that it's not good enough to just go and learn now. We actually have to learn and apply um, and we can't wait. Thanks. Carolyn, thank you very much. I just went uh, to dictionary.com and I asked what is the opposite of sustainable, um, unsustainable, um, undefendable, unsupportable, illogical, irrational, unjustified, defective, flimsy, implausible, senseless, unjustifiable, insupportable, indefensible. You get the idea. If it's not sustainable, you can't be half pregnant on this stuff. If it's not sustainable, it's unsustainable. It can't be done. There is no future. There's only one way and that's sustainability. Um, Peter, to bed in New Zealand. Uh, Joanne, to bed in Australia. Carolyn, to work in Cape Town. And the rest of you also get to your day jobs. For those of you who've joined us from many, many parts of the world, thank you very much for doing so. And we look forward to joining you again soon, talking issues of ESG sustainability and really trying to help you clarify your thinking around these terms, which clearly everyone is grappling with at the moment. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, thank you Carolyn. Thank, thank you, everyone. Peter.